for coming out on a cold night on those for our June meeting of the Melbourne EV Group. Um, we're going to talk about um, home battery storage and that tonight on those. So Dominic's come along and those. He's going to talk about some of the new ideas he's done with the chemistry of lead acid batteries and those. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, building one out of laptop batteries, which is starting to become popular if you look at YouTube and that <laughs> these days. And the number of people in that are doing it. But um, we'll have a bit of news first. That one? No. Um, with a with a home power system, and there's when you have a home battery and that on your solar system, there's a lot more different ideas that you can do. You now have uh, battery storage and that on your home solar. So this is a little video on those about selling it back into the grid. The world is changing, getting smarter, cleaner. All power to that. At Reposit, we're excited about the future of electricity because now you have a battery, you can choose to be an active participant in the electricity system. With the knowledge and freedom to choose how you use your electricity, how best to buy electricity, and how to get a fair price even when you choose to sell the electricity you've captured. And choosing to sell it back to the grid is important. As we add more clean energy sources to the grid, there can be gaps in generation. Right now, energy companies buy from dirty power stations to fill the gaps. You can use your home to sell them clean electricity instead. Put simply, Reposit produces software and control boxes for your home energy system. Think of it like a brain that ensures your solar, appliances and batteries work together efficiently and effectively, which gives you the freedom to maximise your energy self-reliance and use as little from the grid as possible. Reposit has developed specialised software to understand your electricity usage patterns, gather weather predictions and monitor wholesale market opportunities. Software that performs optimization calculations 24 hours in advance, determining how much electricity you'll make, how much electricity you'll need and preparing your system for price spike opportunities. So, if you're new to solar power or you've already got a system in place, check out our website or talk to us. Reposit already works with a large variety of solar and battery systems. Let's find an arrangement that makes sense for you. Then, come rain, hail or glorious sunshine, you'll always have the energy to enjoy the day. So what the Reposit Power System does is um, it's software to work with your uh, home power system and energy or one of the other companies so that you can sell your power up to the grid on those. So you will be able to take advantage of spot prices on those when the price peaks, the battery system will then be able to sell energy into the grid on those so you pay a higher rate than that for it. Um, and also planning of your solar system right now. How much power are you going to need tomorrow? And those, maybe you might have to draw some off peak power um, overnight to top up your battery overnight. And you can get that, that power cheaper off peak at night. So um, this is some of the software that the power is uh, designed to connect with the solar systems. So that to make the solar system more efficient and more smart, especially if it has a battery storage on it. Australia on those. The system that I'm showing there is shown on Catalyst. Uh, no, sorry, it's shown on Garden, uh, Gardening Australia, which is uh, Josh Byrne on those who has a sustainable house in Perth. So um, you'd have to explore to see if it was available in Victoria. If it was, it'd probably be Diamond Energy on those would be the company that uh, would offer you uh, feed-in tariffs or, you know, a spot prices ac access to the uh, national electricity market on those for it. So you'd have to look into that. Um, the other news that's coming up, of course, is Pikes Peak is coming up again. Um, it'll be on, I think, this weekend. It's on, the, it's on in the next few days. And I had a look on the website to see who was competing in it this year. And in the electric division, we've got um, Entropy Racing 
EVS. That was a car that was raced last year. The second one I don't know. Oh, Rice Millen. Yeah, Rice Millen, he actually won the electric uh, section last year. And Tijima, Tijima with uh, team with uh, the Japanese EVEP, the Japanese team. So need you here. He's uh, going to be in it again this year on those. Um, he's using the technology from Rymec Automobili, which is based in Croatia, and they've also produced a new car as well. So they had the Concept 1, and this one's now called the Concept S. So they're also updating their technology. And also this year for the first time we've got um, an electric production car on those. So it's a Tesla Tesla S 90D, the <laughs> dual motor 90D. So um, it's the first time that a Tesla has gone into the, um, into the Pikes Peak race. So it should be interesting to watch. I don't know whether it's uh, whether it's available live on any of the news channels or anything, but um, I think that's on this weekend. It's in uh, Colorado, it's in America. So it's a hill climb event on those uh, climbing up to 14,000 feet. It's the, um, it's the, probably the best known hill climb event now in the world. So it's their 100th anniversary and that uh, this year of the um, Pikes Peak hill climb. So it'd be interesting to see in the news. With um, this car here, uh, Tamage's car, I know that they've, um, they've changed the tyres on it, revised the braking, uh, changed the aerodynamics on it. So they've done uh, quite a bit of work on the car since last year on those, and I remember it came second last year. On those, both the electric cars had, um, well, breakdowns. They had faults, and that occurred in the cars during the race. And uh, neither of them, you know, we were going at full speed on those of what they were capable of. So I think they still came first and second. <laughs> <laughs> I remember they wow. uh, one, one of the cars was running on one transaxle because it actually had a front and rear drive. And uh, one of the motor systems failed. So it was only running on one axle. <laughs> and the other one had a brake failure, a uh, major brake failure. Hmm. The mechanical brakes actually failed on it. Okay, and... Okay. Uh, Beg your pardon? It was going up. <laughs> Probably not on this race, he said no. <laughs> and he came second. The car here, his brakes failed. So it would be interesting to see what happens this year. Okay, that's a bit for some TV news. So tonight um, I've asked Dominic to come along to talk about some of the work that he's done with, um, with lead acid batteries and with the technology and that uh, electrolyte technology. So I'll uh, move mm -hmm. to Dominic now. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Hello, guys. So Dominic Hawkins is my name. Um, Sylph is my first name, but people can't pronounce it, so Dominic is fine. And um, as uh, Paul just briefly mentioned, um, does everyone hear me up the back? Yep. As Paul briefly mentioned, um, one of the things that I've been doing recently is getting around to uh, present workshops and uh, hands-on workshops and theoretical workshops on some of my um, research into alternative electrolytes for lead-acid batteries. So. Um, Paul and I know each other through working on electric vehicle, um, sort of on a road of retail, rev bikes, and um, you know, looking at lithium ferrophosphate builds, NMC, NCA, different forms of lithium ion battery setup. And that's all great. And but they're still um, new produced cells, you know, to be honest, from China. And, um, and while that's a fascinating area, especially for uh, in terms of weight. To like energy density for weight to um, watt hours per kilo for electric cars, electric bikes, things like that, helicopters, quads, a whole other area in terms of home storage where lead acid has been the um, what? Well, you know, let's face it, it's the key battery for the last 150 years since Plant first invented it in France, and um, it has some fundamental flaws to it that mean that it's it's becoming less and less a viable. Um, long-term storage battery while the price of lithium ion and things like uh, nickel ferrous are coming down to meet it in the price point. So what I was always interested in was specifically to help people uh, say in permaculture Melbourne, permaculture Australia groups, off-grid um, DIY sort of homemakers and, and uh, you know homebrew people be able to take lead acid batteries that are already scrap 
or secondhand batteries from landfill or from, um, from waste streams and rejuvenate them, desulfate them, put them back into use. As well as that, being able to look at um, what are the key issues for lead acid that causes it to have such a small lifespan and number of total life cycle count and how can that be shifted and changed so that you could put power back into, um, into the hands of an individual. So I don't know about you, but I'm a fan of homebrew DIYing and the ability to, the ability to sort of take a battery apart and rejuvenate it back together for another 10 years is fascinating. It fascinates me. And I'm um, certainly looking into not only energy sort of, uh, what's the word, independence in terms of self-reliance, but I'm a big fan of um, microgrid ideas so that a local community group should be able to support themselves, build up an energy storage system, a microgrid system, and don't necessarily need to spend $50,000 on a battery set up for it, if that makes sense. So yes, a lot of this work started a few years ago visiting friends with the tiny house movement that I'm sure you guys are well, well um, aware of. And uh, over dinner with them, I thought it was brilliantly ironic that they told me they'd spent $7,000 building their entire house on the trailer and then spent $25,000 purchasing the battery system for it. And I thought that was really weird. <laughs> like brand new, if they were looking for um, you know, uh, low energy density ratios, that would have been fine. But for what their purposes were, they didn't know how to clean up or rejuvenate lead acid batteries. So a whole lot of work over the last 10 years and a lot of work in the wind and solar off-grid sector and myself and um, lots of friends who run a few different consulting companies I've um, been looking into what is the key issue. So a uh, quick hands up to get my head around where people are at. Hands up anyone who's worked with lead acid batteries or has lead acid, like an off-grid setup one. Yep, a few. Um, anyone who's, who's worked with lead acids, say, over more than the last decade, like 20, 30 years, remembers them from the 80s. Yep, cool. And what about anyone who sort of has a chemistry background or regardless of even like introductory or advanced Great, <laughs> one, four. Okay, so I'll try to condense like a 10 hour talk into 20 minutes and um, <clears throat> see how I go. I'll flick through this in just a sec, but to give you a very brief overview, is there um, any markers, pen markers? Is this the black one here that I can use? Yep. Shoo. Is it possible to get the screen off that? Awesome, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we'll condense this very quickly. So the traditional lead acid chemistry, just to get everyone's head around, and what Plant discovered, he was the, the um, French chemist who worked this out originally by accident, but good on him, um, is that we've got two plates, a negative and a positive, I'll call it negatrode and positrode, just for clarity, rather than um, anode and cathode. So anyone who uses the anode and cathode mentality, just bear with me, negatrode and positrode. And this is in an aqueous solution. Any better pens? Oh, actually, you know what? I have brought some in my bag. I have a red one. Do you mind passing my little pouch? Oh, the other one, the green one. Yeah. Thank you. I come with my own pens. Check it out. Oh, uh, that's right. I've done this before. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> No, I didn't bring, didn't bring black. Oh, that's better. Okay. So, as everyone's probably aware, we've got an aqueous solution of um, sulfuric acid. So, this H2SO4, and I'm just going to, don't worry if some of the figures go over your head, you'll get the rough. I'm just trying to pitch it to a different couple of levels. This has a concentration of approximately five mole um, concentration. That's very concentrated, by the way. You know, instant blindness, that kind of thing. So, not, not something to be having fun, just casually messing around with. It would equate to like an approximately 40% uh, weight to weight for sulfuric acid compared to the water it would be dissolved in. We've got a positive plate and a negative plate. To start off with, they're both lead. So for people who remember batteries from 1980s, sort of 70s to 80s, the batteries that you remember then, do you remember if they came in clear acrylic cases? Any flashback to that? Yeah. Any wonder why that doesn't happen anymore? <laughs> because the companies make them so terribly poor that they don't want you to see the degradation of plates. So, so what happens is you've got two lead plates and upon the forming charge, the initial charge, the positive plate, the positrode, 
gains an oxide layer called lead dioxide. And it actually takes a very long time to do this, so it's quite an inefficient original process. That's why they, they have a little cheat. They now paste the lead dioxide onto a, a grid of lead. That's why you read plate pasted plates in modern lead acid batteries. But the negative stays as lead, and the positive becomes lead dioxide. And they're floating in this solution. So during the charge process, you end up, ideally, at the end with these two pieces. What happens during discharge, and where we get most of our voltage from, is that on the positive, the lead Make sure that I copy this directly from my notes so you can read this later on. <laughs> so the lead gathers some hydrogen, which it gets during electrolysis. When you charge the battery, there's hydrogen available. It forms sulfuric acid. The hydrogen is actually, this is a lie. This is actually more like this. It's kind of a very close bond of hydrogen and something called bisulfate, and so this shoots off and decides to form water with the positive electrode. This little guy loops together with more of these sulfate plus electrons that it gains from the negative pole. The discharge goes like this. And this whole thing gives us a very fascinating little piece. The final discharge reaction, we form something called lead sulfate, which is very important, and I'll talk about that in just a sec. And hence, this is the fundamental, what's what this whole paper is about, basically, and what I'm going to talk about tonight as to how we can fix this issue. Um, we form lead sulfate and water. On the negative, the lead bonds with, let me go back to my other notes. With the bisulfate itself to form lead sulfate plus more of the hydrogen. So, on during the discharge, both the positive and negative plates become sulfated. They form this white crystal compound. Has anyone, hands up if anyone's ever seen, let's say the inside of a battery or the clear acrylic cases, there's this very obvious white crystal buildup. And um, unfortunately I wasn't set up enough to bring some test batteries to show you, so it'll all be theory, but if you can picture in your head, this kind of color of the, the lead itself, you know? And the lead dioxide is like um, a very, very dark chocolate brown kind of color. And during discharge, they form, they both form lead sulfate, which is this, almost like this, a, a white metallic -y compound, which is insoluble, highly insoluble, almost as insoluble as radium sulfate and calcium sulfate, which is um, plaster of Paris. If you can get your head around how much that's not going to dissolve, if anyone's made clay. And what happens is during the next recharge process, theoretically, this sulfate will bond with hydrogen that's formed at the negative because the hydrogen appears because it splits the water into uh, oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen appears. It's meant to grab the sulfate off the plate and reform the bisulfate anion. And then on the positrode, the oxygen displaces the sulfate, has a higher reactivity. So what you find is that in very old batteries, or sulfated batteries, like most car batteries after three or four years, if you were to take them apart, the positive, the positrode, is actually very clean. It still looks like that chocolate brown color. And it almost doesn't have any um, evidence of this white sulfate crystal because it gets effectively pulled off from the oxygen in the um, charge process. The negative just keeps building and building and building until it um, it starts to it, it's much thicker yeah than the lead at, and, and the layer so it starts to bulge so and you've seen bulging batteries you see where the sides <laughs> pop out so the sulfate there's all these plates very thinly put together little separators and the sulfate builds up and up and up and just pushes them out breaks the separators and can short between plates and then pushes and bulges the plastic of the case itself. So you get all this mechanical damage and so on and so forth. So for anyone who has um, worked with lead acid battery or, or has an off-grid house, as those of you who put your hand up before, anyone want to give me the standard depth of discharge that you're usually allowed to take lead acid to? So if you were to set up, say, an off-grid house or even like a, even a caravan, what would the depth of discharge be? Yep, yep. Yeah. 
So 50% is like best case scenario. <laughs> and, um, and that would be for ideally tubular wound, spiral wound de deep cell, deep cycle, sorry, batteries. So 30% depth of discharge is the standard for plate batteries in an aqueous solution. So for a car batteries, for an off-grid bat house battery, 30% is the total amount of power you can you pull per time between before the next charge cycle in order to get your lifespan out of it. So just to give you, so, yeah, which is crazy. <laughs> Especially when you compare to lithium, we're looking at like a 90% depth of discharge, you know, you're like, hmm. And that's why, I mean, I've got an electric trike, you know, I ride around and I've got a, I've got a two kilowatt 48 volt battery that's about this big. It's insane, you know, I, it's almost unimaginable from having worked on lead acid for so long. But in terms of being able to build, say, off-grid houses or um, caravans or stationary applications, so I'm not too worried about the weight, if we can fix some of these problems, Chemically, there's a world of incredibly cheap lead acid batteries. People can't even give them away, you know, these days. The, re the Australian recycling scheme for lead acid is pretty well formed, and they estimate about 98% of um, all batteries that go through the scheme are recycled, you know, up to 99%. Standard kind of figures from independent researchers show that it's more like 60 to 70% of all batteries in Australia even make it to the recycling scheme. They either sit in garages for decades on end, or they get dumped on the side of the road. India and Africa and those kinds of countries who don't have the infrastructure have a massively lower um, recycling rate, you know, like three to 5% for India. And, and um, friends of mine who do humanitarian work overseas send back, one of them sent me a photo, Tim um, uh, Webster is his name. He sent a photo of a little village that they were working in, and down at the river was just lead acid batteries upturned into the river because they'd stopped working. You know, they'd, they'd just been, the charge regulator had failed over sort of like a 10 year period on little remote power build. No one really knew what to do with them. There's no recycling. So they just got dumped in the river, which was like terrifying, you know, to think about. Downstream to drinking water and farms and that kind of thing. So I set about from a number of angles to look at this problem. And given the enormous distribution infrastructure of lead acid around the world, like ridiculous, yeah? Think of every internal combustion engine that exists. Let's say that 99% of them use a lead acid battery as a starter. And you think of the sheer number of lead acid batteries and distribution chains that must exist worldwide to make that possible. It's insane. So if we could shift that and change that, we've already got a massive system in place. Nothing new has to be built, yeah? So, in terms of a brand new battery, if you were to buy a brand new lead acid battery, anyone give me a, an idea for the warranty you would get for a brand new car battery? Two years. Yeah, you get 12, 12 months for, um, for commercial use, six months for taxi use, if you read the little, which is funny. Um, one year, if you pay you know, your $120 for a good RACV battery, you get 2.5 years. Yeah, that's right. So. In terms of warranty, they're made to fail, and there's um, there's three key reasons that they fail. One I'm going, one is one that we can fix. The other two are mechanical faults and problems that can can be fixed, but not chemically. So, in terms of um, in terms of if you were to buy a brand new battery, a car battery, and you expect your two and a half to three years from it, if at that point you were to Let's say you're very smart and you buy a cap battery, not, not a rubbish sealed battery. I'll get into that later on. You can ask me more questions about the calcium silver alloy at the tea room later if you want. If you were to dump out all the liquid, store it, neutralize it, take it, back, take it off to your service station, here's a lot tub of sulfuric acid for you, and you were to fill it up with Epsom salts, with magnesium sulfate, maximum concentrations, about 1.3 mole, 1.6 mole, I think, you would find that you would have a slightly lower overall voltage, less cranking power, but your battery would last for about seven to 10 years on average. If, if, you, were, if you had sized a battery that was uh, still able to crank your car over, you know, so you, you're used to a little 50 amp battery, you buy your 70 amp one, you put your magnesium sulfate in and it still works. So I was really interested. Has anyone read anything on, say, Google about Epsom salts, rejuvenating lead acid batteries. Anyone come across this before? Yeah, yeah. a little bit before. Yep, sodium sulfate being used. Come across that one? Well, it's changing the electrons. 
With fresh sulfuric? Yeah. Yeah. No. Ah, with sodium. Yeah. Or magnesium sulfate. What about charging? Yeah, well that, that's an option. So what I'll just, I know that I'm trying to compress a random amount of information into one point. We're going to funnel towards something, bear with me. So let's say that, just to go back to this, during this discharge reaction, what we end up getting is on both, this, on both these plates, we get this sulfate buildup called lead sulfate. It's an insulator, so it actually stops electrical conductivity between the plates. So therefore, no more, there's no more, um, let's say that this portion of the plate is now cut off from the electrolyte, and amp power is directly proportional to the plate surface area. So if you've halved your surface area, you halved your output of your battery, as everyone's seen, you know, like you have your old starter battery and it goes through winter and then you try to crank and the voltage is fine, but every time you turn your, your key, it just, you know, it just drops really quickly, like it can't deliver the amp output. What happens is that this sulfate builds up on the negative and it never goes back into the solution. So according to the spec sheets that you read, they make wild figures like 50 to 60% is returned, which is, I don't know where they get those figures from. It's more like 20 to 10% that I've observed. So the depth of discharge, the 30%, it's called DOD, the maximum amount that you're allowed to drop, to take out of the battery each cycle before charge, that figure, they couple up with their life cycle. So, you know, you buy your 2.5 year car battery, you buy your seven year off grid deep cycle battery. If you really have money, you buy your tubular wound 15 year deep cycle batteries, you know, from um, SRLA or like Optima, those kinds of companies. They, the life cycle, the number of 100, 700, 400 cycles means they've determined if you were to take the battery down by 30% each charge cycle, how long would it take before you completely sulfate in the entire negatron? At which point, or let, let's say, they say up to 80%, you know. So of 80% of the negatron is sulfated, and you'll get 20% of your total output. That's how they get that figure. So when you buy a lead acid battery, and if they tell you, oh, it's got 700 life cycles, you can be like, right, so that means that after 700 times of dropping down this amount, this plate will be basically white, and I'll have to bring the battery back to you, which you'll take, by the way, for free, and then you'll sell me another one. Very smart. <laughs> anyone, uh, where we said before about uh, the 50% depth of discharge, anyone care to hedge some ideas? If you've, got a, um, if you've got your deep cycle battery, anyone bought a deep cycle battery? Caravan, camping, anything like that? Yeah? You've, yeah. Totally. AGM gel and um, flooded valve regulators. So there's four different types. They all suffer from the same sulfation issue, but the AGM and the gel have a slightly different way of um, could of maintaining sulfate in the compound so they can increase their life cycle and reducing shedding and corrosion. But I'll talk about that later. So you've got your, you buy, your, let's say you buy your $150 deep cycle battery, yeah? And it comes with a seven-year life span at 30% depth of discharge. Anyone care to head just a guess? If you were to decide to take that to 50% depth of discharge casually, you know, each day, any idea how much it would reduce your life cycle by? How many years of life you might expect out of your seven-year battery? Oh, it's a slightly better than that. It halves it. On average, every 20% drop of um, DOD will halve the, the lifespan remaining, which is insane, yeah? So any single time that you drop to that 50%, you halve the total amount because the sulfate builds up and is very hard to dissolve back in at such an, a high acid concentration. So from looking at this years ago, I stepped back and I thought, well, the obvious problem is the sulfate buildup. <laughs> You know, it seemed kind of obvious to me that if, there, if either this, it wasn't forming the lead sulfate to begin with, or there was something in the battery that was more active than the lead that could strip the sulfate off the lead, you'd solve the problem, surely. There's two other key problems. One's called corrosion, which is kind of a misnomer. What they mean is that uh, when they make these pasted batteries, they take just a, a lead grid, kind of like a mesh, 
And in, the, in a factory, they pre-make lead dioxide as a powder, and they literally just paste it and dry it onto these grids, these lead grids. And then what happens is, in the high, um, slowly during charging, the charge voltage actually kind of kicks the lead dioxide off, you know, away, and you can watch that. It all, it's a sludge at the bottom of the battery. Eventually, if it tunnels a little hole into the lead of the grid, it starts converting the grid itself to lead dioxide. The grid corrodes and the whole plate disintegrates. So that's called corrosion. That builds up at the bottom of the battery. And if anyone remembers batteries from the 80s, smart battery manufacturers built cases where the plates had like an inch of gap at the bottom of the battery. And after 20 years of constant use, a friend of mine showed me a photo that there was about this much, like about half of that was this powdered lead dioxide paste form. A car, standard car battery that you'll buy, you'd be very lucky if you could find more than one mil of gap at the bottom of that. Totally. Well, what happens? Because the lead dioxide is conductive. As it builds up, it shorts out plates. And then your battery's fine, but it drops to 10 volts. And you don't understand why it's still running a light bulb. You know, if you still short it out, you'll jump five meters into the air. But it can't start your crank over anymore. So then you buy another one. So there's all these very kind of planned obsolescent tricks, you know, to, to cause the, the degradation of lead acid, which is sad because it could be a very, not that I think that it's a particularly environmentally sound option at all, but given the distribution network and the infrastructure currently, I think that it could be a very good contender for off-grid homes, especially given that the price of it, if you were to buy new, is the, still the cheapest rechargeable battery type in watt hour per capacity. And if you're able to find a source of second-hand batteries, which any, anyone can, Telstra, Telstra can't even give them away. The Melbourne Water Board, Yarra Water, they have them all for their um, water monitoring systems. They've got policy that they have to be replaced every 12 months. So if you know the right people, you can just get them shipped to your door, like 1,000 amp, 2 volt cells at a piece, you know, for free. They'll pay you to take them, five bucks a battery. They have to pay to have them removed. So it's, it's a really interesting kind of thing. You know, like on one side, you've got this, this off-grid market and this battery market that's powering ahead with new technology and, and um, new lithium you know, and new materials. And then on the other end, you've got, this, you've got old uh, rechargeable chemistries, the nickel ion chemistries, the alkaline chemistries from, um, I forget the name of the chemistry invented them before Edison um, stole it. Um, you've, you've got alkaline and sulfate-based rechargeable chemistries that have been around for like 120, 150 years that could work really well. So short of everyone going into manufacturing your own batteries with the best possible plate gap and all that kind of stuff, one of the solutions for this, like I said, is either to stop the sulfate from forming in the first place or to f insert something into the battery chemistry that is going to be so active that it steals that away from the lead. So let me fly through. Da, 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 da. This is a very big PDF. I, got, uh, I ended up just quickly going to Officeworks to print five copies as well if anyone wants. But give me your email and I'm happy to send you a, a copy. I just want to show you some of this chemistry. Okay, so I know it's only on one screen, sorry. But what you're kind of looking at is some um, theoretical equations for, can you guys see around the corner? Yeah. For if we were to take Epsom salts, so Paul mentioned that he's heard of Epsom salt being used. It's quite a thing. You can just Google and you'll see pages and YouTube clips of people saying, rejuvenate lead acid batteries with Epsom salts. You know, and, and the YouTube clips are quite funny because generally it's people saying, so here's the really definite concentrations. You want to take kind of approximately about this much and that, and you do it, and then you shake it five times, and, uh, and you clap your hands, and it works really well for about a month and then it doesn't work anymore, and then they throw out the battery and get a new one, and it was a really good experiment. That's basically like the end of the YouTube clips. And I couldn't find, I looked and searched, I couldn't find any information of like database for university testing or lab testing for different sulfates. You know, talking to friends who are, I'm not a chemist, talking to friends, I've never been to uni, talking to friends who are like chemistry lecturers and um, PhD students in different forms of electrochem, 
and no one could come up with a database for me. And I thought, surely this has been done. <laughs> yeah, like if it was invented 150 years ago, surely someone's thought of using a different sulfate electrolyte than sulfuric acid. Surely, <laughs> you know, like we can't be that, we can't have missed that by that much. So since I couldn't find one, I decided to make one instead. And to start off with, to answer some of the Epsom salt YouTube clips and chit chats, if we were to look at a battery, ooh, a battery that's been used already and it's got some forms of lead sulfate on the negative electrode, and also it's in a discharge state, so it has it on the positive, and we were to just empty out the liquid and refill it with Epsom salts, you know, just go to Woolworths, buy some magnesium um, sulfate, mix it up in water, don't even bother with distilled water, you know, that's an awesome, um, that's a, it's a fascinating myth. Um, but the majority of the particles, microparticles in the water that are going to plate onto the lead is kind of negligible. I wouldn't waste my money buying distilled water, especially if it's an old battery, yeah? So just to put it in your head, if you wanted to do this experiment, just use tap water, filtered water if you could get it, and Epsom salts. It'll cost you about $2, you know? You were to pour out all the sulfuric acid and refill only with Epsom salts. During charge, you'll end up with hydrogen being formed at the negative because it's electrolyzing the water. You'll end up with electrons being pushed into the negative from your charger or whatever. And what happens is in the presence, this is my theory, it's called the bisulfate theory, and it's the closest that I've been able to work out how it could be desulfating the battery, which is fascinating to watch. If, if anyone, if you could get your hands on an uh, acrylic case battery, I'll show you some photos of some later, you can actually watch the negative plate clean up from, a, from this color to this color in a matter of about a week. It's fascinating to watch. And it starts, conveniently, as the chemistry kind of tells us, it starts at the negative and it kind of webs out across towards the sections that are most far away from the bus bar. So the magnesium is so much more reactive than the lead, like up times so in terms of standard um, potential, that any time that the magnesium is available in ionic form and is floating around some compound that lead has formed, the magnesium will steal this partner away from the lead. So the lead gets left lonely and it ends up forming lead as a solid again. It takes the electrons from the magnesium. The magnesium strips away whatever is attached to it. And, and in this case, if we could somehow theoretically get just pure liquid magnesium into the battery, it would just strip the sulfate away from the lead and you would clean the lead and you'd have magnesium sulfate. But since I can't do that, I don't know how to, I haven't got enough magnesium or a furnace, you know, to, and that would be insane. So an alternative is, well, we use a common ingredient that I figure even like every village in China would be able to get Africa. It's a very simple compound, you know, to be able to get in large quantities, non-toxic. What happens is at over a certain voltage, the magnesium will be forced away from the sulfate. And in the presence of hydrogen, very important, this guy is really important, in the presence of hydrogen, it grabs both the sulfates and the hydrogen and forms something called magnesium bisulfate. And it's really incredible. You can start off testing the pH of this battery that you've just done. You go down to your garage and you've got a, a battery from 10 years ago. And you know, it's like what we described. It's kind of got 11 or 12 volts across the terminals, but the minute you put a load on it, it just sags. So if you were to take that, dump out the sulfuric into a tub, neutralize it, and then you were to fill it with your um, magnesium sulfate, Epsom salts, and if you took a pH reading of that, a little litmus paper test, you'd find that it would be about 6.5 or 7, 7 pH. So it's neutral, effectively. Over a week, if you were to test that again, not only does the amps of your battery increase, it'll start cranking over your engine and your tractor, etc., but the pH of the liquid starts to decrease towards 2. 1.5. It starts exhibiting this hydrogen that it can grab. So you can watch this process actually occur. It's really, really cool. On the positive, the lead sulfate, which is going to become um, lead dioxide anyway, and the magnesium is not attracted to the positive pole. It's a positive charged um, ion, so it doesn't really take place over here. This just goes through its normal reaction. Lead sulfate joins with water. It's split. It has electrons taken away from it, the oxygen that's being bubbled up in the, uh, in the liquid through the electrolyzing, the electrolysis, sorry, um, forms lead dioxide on the plate, and you end up 
reforming this HSO4, which bonds with more magnesium later on. So effectively what happens is over weeks and slowly and slowly and slowly, it strips all this lead sulfate crystal away from <coughs> the plates, effectively the negative plate, and forms this magnesium bisulfate compound. This fascinating sort of stuff, which you can find data sheets for. And sodium bisulfate, they sell at Bunnings, you know, as a pool acid for, for um, lowering pH. So, I'm, you know, if you weren't too worried, you could take this out and do something else with it. But I wouldn't recommend it. So you would have effectively, over a couple of weeks, stripped this, this lead sulfate problem away from the negatron. And you've cleaned the plates. It's fascinating. In the tea room, ask me. I'm happy to show you some photos I've got on the iPad of different plates during different stages of cleaning. You go back to a battery that's like as if it was new off the press. So the, the negative plates, especially because they're made relatively thick, and the, the um, sulfate layer is only surface. It builds on the surface. If you imagine that you've got, you've got this, this lead plate, and let's say that it's, oh, let's say it's even like 0.5 mil thick. And you've got this, this lead sulfate crystal that builds right on the outer layer, like microns, yeah? Even if it took sort of 0.1 mil off in total, you're still left with 0.4 mil of actual lead that's sitting underneath the plate. It's, it's just as fresh as the day it came out of the factory. Nothing's happened to it. You know, it hasn't gone anywhere. If you can take that sulfate layer away, magically, you get access to that lead again. And if you go back to that little chit chat we had about how the life cycles, they, they equate the life cycles to the buildup of the lead sulfate over time, you would find that all of a sudden, if you, if you were able to strip all the lead sulfate off all the negative plates, and you've, you'd say you had a battery that had a 700 cycle life, I'd expect that you'd be back to another 600 new cycles on top of that. You know? if the thing that would finally kind of kill the battery in the end would be this shedding of active material on the positive. And depending on the amount of space you have at the bottom, it would, it would eventually short out the plate. Ironically, though, while you dump out the sulfuric acid, you end up washing out a whole bunch of that with it. And that's why it's important to take that to a chemical hazard <laughs> uh, place. Can't stress that enough to, to deal with that. So does, everyone, does anyone have any questions so far about that specific kind of chemistry? You can get your head around how we've got these lead plates and we've got them in this. Yep. <laughs> and we've got them in this solution of very concentrated acid. And what's occurring is that slowly, as it charges up, the acid doesn't change. But as it discharges, all the hydrogen comes out of the acid. That's why we're using an acid. We need the hydrogen to form water with the oxygen. Otherwise, nothing would happen. Put tap water in a brand new battery with lead plates, charge it up, you don't get any discharge. There's no discharge reaction. You know? So we need the hydrogen in some form for this reaction. As it discharges, it starts to put it starts to grow these sulfate crystals on the negative plate. And let's say you only do like, oh, you know, just a few. So, so for the first month, you've just, kind of, you've just kind of got a few little bits of sulfate crystal. And then, has anyone ever grown crystals? How they grow from a seed, from the string? Once you've got one, it seeds. So it seeds sort of in a fractal uh, geometric pattern. So it'll start growing from that one. So maybe after, maybe after a year, you know, you've, You've lost, I don't know, maybe maybe like 5% of the total plate area. And remember that it doesn't have to be all the plates either. For some quick electrical theory, let's say, two, three, four, five, six. You've got your six cell battery, because lead acid's only two volt per cell. That's its well, standard reduction. Oh, even my own things aren't working. And, um, and so in your car battery, it's actually, the two terminals are a bit of a, a, bit of a misnomer, you know. What it actually is, is it runs down into one cell, and then the next cell, next one, next one, next one, positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative. And when you do this, when you have batteries in series like this, the voltage increases, so it adds 2 plus 2, et cetera, so you get 12 volts. But the amperage stays the same, the current stays the same. So it's Ohm's law theory. And what that means is that the available amps 
will be equal to the lowest common denominator. So you could have a 100 amp 2 volt cell here and a 10 amp 2 volt cell there and the maximum amount of draw that you will get is 12 volt 10 amp regardless of it. So you can see how even if even if you had sulfate build up on one negative plate one cell group rather there's many plates per cell group you've compromised the amp hour rating of the entire pack and so the other cells could be perfect but they start to they start to dwindle away with you and they don't get proper charge and anyone who works with batteries you know when they don't when they get out of balance from each other or it's all over you know <laughs> the cells start to kill each other off in a way you know so with this process is everyone with me up to the point where you've got lead, lead sulfate building build up going on you, the more you discharge it, the more that occurs. So if you were to discharge at 100%, you'd take your seven-year battery to about a six-month life cycle at best, <laughs> if you really bought a good one, you know? That's how hectic and fast the buildup is. And the two choices would be to either stop the sulfate buildup or insert something into the chemistry that could kind of steal it away or, or change that. Some people, um, again, if you do Google searching for rejuvenating batteries, People come up with all kinds of ideas. They use sodium hydroxide and um, like potassium or potassium hydroxide, um, thinking that it will neutralize the acid. They don't quite understand what it is they're trying to neutralize. And they end up just unfortunately um, reducing the lead dioxide in the hydroxide to lead as well. They don't really form what they want. So there's a lot of ideas that have been tried along this. But for some reason, I couldn't find any central database of what happens if you if you ran lead batteries on different sulfates and there's heaps <laughs> there's so many different sulfate forms that you could try and magnesium is just one example i'll jump down here so this is just some very just a, this is a sh short tiny list this is like there's, there's a lot more than this um yeah Going through the um, sulfates, and we don't have to use sulfate, you could use phosphates. Like there's a, it, it became very apparent to me that in, an, in a, um, an industry that has worked with um, lead acid for such a long period of time, there is a massive gaping hole of research into alternative electrolytes that could be used. And I think that the poor chemistry is being left behind for dead, which is fine in terms of like it's, um, uh, it's pretty crappy in terms of what our energy density for, you know, what hours per kilo. So it's not like I'm going to strap lead acids to my electric bike. <laughs> I don't want to strap 100 amp hour lead acids and try to go down the street, you know. But in terms of houses or caravans, things like that, even your car battery, imagine only having to buy a car battery once a decade. Much, I mean, on all counts, yeah? So looking at even just the list of sulfate options, the list is really large. There's a whole bunch of sulfates that are going to be usable, some that aren't usable. We obviously have to use liquid, like we need it to be an aqueous solution, liquid solution. So we can't use plaster of Paris. We can't use radium sulfate, which we wouldn't want to anyway. Part of the purpose is to look at something that could be produced to increase our health, like try to reduce the toxic death to us all. So barium sulfate's a no-go, mercury sulfate's a no-go, things like that. The list starts to cut down pretty quick to the possible environmentally benign or advantageous sulfates. But there's heaps. There's like lithium sulfate, which is really interesting. Um, aluminium sulfate, one of my favorite ones, although less favorable because of its um, environmental toxicity, but it does really cool stuff chemically, which I'll talk about. Iron sulfate, nickel sulfate, not so good. Zinc sulfate is really interesting. There's a patent in the 1960s from a guy who invented a um, lead acid they invented. He just discovered lead acid with um, zinc sulfate, like a 10% sulfuric acid, 90% zinc sulfate. Found that he formed a whole new battery that worked in a totally different way. And um, the guy died. The patent was <laughs> bought by Exide Corp. Yes. And uh, we never heard of that one again. So no surprising there. But um, just going through the list, it, there's like months, years of, of research sulfates, phosphates, nitrates, there's all different compound forms that could be possibly used. They do different things, they have different um, properties. So, so on one hand, I was interested in saying, well, where is all this research and why isn't it done? And if it is done in little bits, how can we pull it all together into a centralized 
system because the common person doesn't seem to know, you know? You hear about Epsom salts and that's about it. If you really go digging, you hear about sodium sulfate and then that's, that's you'll never find anything beyond that. Some people, Alum, um, John Bedini, who's a um, sort of engineering physicist, a sort of electrical, electrophysicist in uh, the States, suddenly came up realizing he could just use alum, which is potassium aluminium sulfate. It's used for preserving food. I wouldn't eat it. I don't want to intake aluminium, but you get the idea. Um, all of a sudden, same as like the zinc sulfate battery. Oh, he invented a brand new battery. We didn't really, if you get what I mean. Like it's just the work that we should have been doing the last 150 years. Slowly, and then there's a cult following of like, no, it only works if you stand on your head five times and you do a cartwheel on the fifth moon of the month. And so people have all kinds of weird results with it. And I wanted to go through and find out, well, if it seems so simple, and if all the resources are, are like massively readily available, what could possibly account for the enormous difference in test results? And then started looking into solubility, molar concentration, uh, the stripping power of certain compounds. So for example, potassium sulfate sucks. Terrible, terrible as a stripping ability. Like its total amount, maybe you can see here, it has almost one of the lowest total amounts of sulfate that could be stripped per liter based on the maximum solubility that you could actually fit in the battery um, compared to something like if we use sodium sulfate. And these are all just per liter, so doing the same amount of work. Got 131 grams per liter of sulfate could be stripped theoretically off the negative plate. And further in, earlier in the PDF, I explain, I make some constants. So in order to calculate theoretically how much sulfate could we have to strip, if we took the worst case scenario and you were to go to, you found a, a battery on the side of the road or you had one in the garage that had been there for 20 years and it's entirely possible, because it self-discharges, that every single negative plate is white. Yeah, that's, that's possible. That's a total possibility. I've seen those. We could theorize the maximum amount of sulfate in grams <laughs> per liter that could be in the battery based on the concentration of sulfuric acid. And I won't go too far into that at the moment, but it's on the PDF. And then we can look at, well, what are our options in terms of stripping that? And already you, could see, you can see why people get such success with magnesium sulfate in comparison to potassium and even sodium. But these are just one level of factors. There's so many other factors. Aluminium has um, one of the highest. Alum, quite low. Zinc is really up there, but it's a totally different process. So this was just a small chart that looked at solubility levels, just to start to show people that there's all this data that should be mined, that people could be working on, you know, and try to get anyone who, who is kind of thought about this or working on this at home, you know, to, to share data and kind of input like a bit of a central database and build, build some um, systems because I, have seen, and I firmly believe that very large off-grid battery backup systems could be built from scrap lead-acid batteries that have reached the end of their life, not really, reached the end of their current usable life in this electrolyte, and they're just being pilfed. A friend of mine uh, who runs an off-grid, in fact, this is one of the best contacts I ever made, he runs a company called Aztec Wind and Solar, um, Aaron Rennie, a friend of mine who installs off-grid and grid connect solar and, uh, and wind turbines, domestic and off-grid, etc. He says that on average, every year he does about four or five complete battery um, replacement sets for off-grid customers out in the country who bought batteries 10 or 15 years ago and now they're, you know, they're at the end of their serviceable life, they're getting 50 to 40 percent of their total capacity now. They don't know what to do with them, so they just buy a new set. And he says, on average, for those houses, it costs them between thirty-five dollars to $45,000. That's the removal cost of him to come and take the batteries away, the purchase cost of the new batteries, the installation, and then all the kind of labor, you know, back and forth. I thought, wow, like that's great for his business. It sucks for the people. I mean, you know, and so he's ironically helping me, even though it could terribly pull the bottom out of his business. Um, but all those batteries, he, he basically gets... $5 per battery from metal recyclers, regardless of amp hour size. So it's not even weighed by, by lead weight, you know? Imagine if they, if they weighed it, like lead is very expensive. 
in terms of recycling, you take a bit of lead flashing, you can get a lot of money out of that. Imagine if they weighed your thousand amp battery, you'd be chicken out hundred dollar notes at a time, but they don't, they give you five bucks. And Exide and um, Yuasa, it's a Chinese battery company, they own the recycling systems, you know? So they get all those products back for five bucks, basically. And I think for a battery system that would have cost them maybe 25 grand 10 years ago, to get $5 per battery is ridiculous, laughable, yeah? And that even lithium, looking at life cycles, I do a lot of work, I have a different paper on reducing the flammability risk for lithium and a charge voltage regime. And looking at lithium's kind of, you know, NMC cells, 700 to 1,000 cycle life setup, you're still averaging about five to seven years at, at less than 1C discharge rates. And on your electric bike, you'd be lucky if you were getting five years out of your nickel metal cobalt, nickel manganese cobalt um, lithium ion cell. So I kept thinking like all of these new technologies, their total lifespan is still really small and it really still traps us into a kind of very expensive cycle of purchasing and repurchasing and no doubt I'm sure that we'll have lithium recycling centers set up in the same way because they realize that they can sell you the batteries for a lot of money and then recycle them for a dollar a piece and they make a fortune and you're trapped in endlessly buying lithium batteries or endlessly buying lead acid. And I wanted to fix that. So theoretically, I have not, um, I've not been doing this for 30 to 40 years, so I don't have that kind of data, you know, unfortunately. I'm only 30 now, I don't have the data of um, <clears throat> battery experimenting like that going back. But on current observation of how much it cleans up the cells and the test cells and examples and given the kind of 10-year lifespans that that um, the clients got of those before I got my hands on them, I don't see why you couldn't have a lead acid battery set that couldn't go for decades, you know, 20, 30 years. If you can just solve this problem and you've got a smart, a very awesomely built uh, contingency into the engineering, Lead acid batteries should be able to survive for decades, not years. So this PDF and all of my workshops have been about taking people through the actual process, because everyone's terrified. And um, talk about it theoretically, it's great. When you get people out on a farm doing it, like we did a tiny house battery rejuvenation uh, workshop. We got about maybe 40 people. And um, I was quite impressed. You know, a lot of people who'd never even, they'd never even serviced their own car battery or exchanged it before. Um, people like especially young people who never even changed a tire and they were they were out in rubber nitrile gloves you know and goggles and masks and overalls dumping battery acid out into tubs and neutralizing and mixing up and I thought it was really empowering just to help show people that you don't need to be a chemist to um, to do some of this there are some obvious um, health concerns and safety protocols that need to be adhered adhered to but it's not rocket science you know for want of a better word um, there are a couple of extra things that I've discovered in caveats, but what I was interested in is like, after we've stripped all this sulfate away and we've formed this bisulfate, which I've moved on from now, this magnesium bisulfate in that example, I thought maybe, wouldn't it be awesome if the very compound that we've created could now just be left in there and act as the new hydrogen donor you know, in the kind of process. And I found that for some compounds that is the case and for some compounds it's not. I don't understand yet why. And I assume it could be to do with different charge um, voltages, like where they separate and compound at different charge rates. I'm still exploring that. But I have found that, and all the, the work in the PDF, almost any sulfate compound that you could get off the shelves, and garden stores are a, a gold mine of sulfates, Zinc sulfate, mag manganese sulfate, but don't use manganese sulfate. Um, magnesium sulfate, potassium sulfates, potassium aluminium sulfate. It's really interesting. They have them all for um, raising, you know, mineral levels in the soil. Um, you can get them really cheap, and almost any sulfate compound will desulfate the battery. Not all the sulfate compounds will then allow you to actually use it as a proper battery, you know, to get all your amp hour back out of it. But even then, if you were to dump that, that um, bisulfate back out and just refill it with new sulfuric acid, you're still theoretically back to your seven to 10 year life cycle again. 
So there's some options and I'm still exploring more. I'd, what I'd like to come up with is like one or two quintessential compounds that I could present as a complete closed loop process that both does all the stripping, the desulfating, and acts as the hydrogen donor as the acid for the, for the future use of the battery so that it'd be like a do once, forget about it, never have to think about it. Again, just top water up once a year. But I'm not quite up to that point yet. But I, wanted, I do get around and present this because a lot of people have heard of it or they've never heard of it or they've heard of it and they've read that it was a sham and they've just written it off and just go on to kind of not thinking that it's a viable option. So, yes. Yep. Well, the oldest one that I've got currently going was a year and a half ago um, on a 100 amp deep cycle 12 volt pretty standard crappy battery from um, the Lion Corp, which is pretty crap. Um, it was found on the side of the road, and I thought, great, donor battery. Of 100 amp, I was able to get back to about 80 to 85 amp hour capacity out of it, and I assume that maybe it's through like degradation of the plates that I've lost that last 15%. But so far, after a year and a half, it's not particularly showing any signs of, it's like it's just showing as if it was giving that 85 amp hour new, again, you know, as if it was an 85 amp hour battery. So, but it's only a year and a half of data. You know, I, hopefully in 10 years I could answer that question better. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things I've heard about, uh, oh, thank you. One of the things I've heard about uh, batteries, AGM batteries mm. in particular, is you can uh, do a process called equalization where you put yep. in 15 16 to 20 volts yep. so for a, Eight hours, and hopefully it doesn't smoke too much. Does it, does it work or not? It does. It does. Um, so the reason that it works, and I could answer that quickly. Go to my other notes. Um, the reason that equalization works is because there is a potential. Um, there's a standard potential voltage for this lead sulfate. So it's saying that over a certain uh, over a certain charge voltage, this this compound will, um, and the lead from this compound will be more willing to separate and become solid lead again. So to give you an idea, this at the moment, if we were to break that into its little, if we were to look at it on a much smaller scale, we're actually looking at lead in a two plus state. So it's given away two electrons and it's kind of hungry for two more. Bonds with sulfate, which has two extra electrons that it's needing to do something with. So they marry up and they have a great old time. And this lead is, is still, it's still lead, you know, it's still just waiting there at over 2.6 volts across this cell, the lead, and that, that, I won't explain it now, but that's just the total of two half cell equations. So you look at what the voltage would be for the lead going from, I know this is not quite the answer to the question, lead going from lead solid to um, an ionic form and then the reverse occurring on the positrode, which is actually from lead 2 plus to lead 4 plus tetravalent lead uh, minus 2 electrons. So they give you a total voltage if, of 2.4 volts, which ironically, if anyone who knows lead acid, is the charging voltage per cell. That gives you 14.4 volts for a 12 volt battery. Um, if you go over that, you start to get into the territory towards this 2.6 volt limit where this lead is more willing to separate from the sulfate and take the electrons and just become solid again. Uh, and so lithium utilizes this in the, in the chemistry. It's very interesting. And um, come on. Um, but while it does work for reducing the sulfate on the negative, unfortunately, it has a negative effect on the positive. So that's a odd, that's a really weird sentence to have said. Um, once you start getting over about 2.4, 2.5, or five volts, the extra voltage actually like bursts off and kicks off particles of the lead dioxide from the positive, which is really weird when you look at it. And at first, you know, because I've had fun, I was like, oh, well, battery, we'll just crack it up. I've put 52 volts into a single two volt cell at times, coming straight off solar, you know, just putting solar through to be like, let's look at all the different options for desulfation, you know, let's look at what happens. And yeah, it totally strips um, sulfate off the negative in random patchy ways. Uh, it ignites the hydrogen that's generated as well. That's terrifying. So you get these, these uh, awesome, if you do it at night, the bottom of the battery keeps lighting up 
and you get these great sonic booms because I have clear acrylic, acrylic batteries, so I don't recommend that. But the positive, literally, you can hear it popping and it like explodes. So, and you can watch these little chocolate brown powders burst into the liquid solution and then expose um, either the, either they force that off the grid alloy and they start to weaken the grid and then they expose the grid to the sulfation, like to the electrolyte. Um, or I imagine that they kind of take with them other chunks of the, of the dioxide. So the equalization charge theory, it totally works for reducing sulfation. If anyone doesn't know what you're talking about, sometimes on charges, um, and you see it like on, even on solar regulators, they'll have something called desulfation or e equalization. And what they mean is that for a short burst of time, for like three to five hours, they will allow, generally it's about 15, my pens are running out, 15.4 volts across the total. Anyone want to quickly divide that by six and calculate what that would be per cell? 2.57? So way above this threshold. Um, they do that for about five or six hours in an attempt to kind of push up the uh, cells that are doing poorly because of sulfate buildup. It does a lot of heating damage. The heating warps. The lead melts at a very low temperature, you remember? So the heating literally warps the lead and the separators and a lot of weird stuff occurs. Doing it on and off every now and then is probably not terribly, like, you know, once a year for five hours would be fine. I totally wouldn't recommend it as an ongoing solution. <laughs> There are, there, are, there are a whole other realm of thinking for battery desulfation, which is called pulse desulfation. Anyone ever heard of the pulse tech desulfators? Yep. Do you guys know how they work? Or Yeah. What they've done, there's two different types. It's really ironic when you look on eBay. The cheaper ones are just a DC pulse, and they just take back the charge voltage. They, they simply amplify it up in a boost circuit, like a minty boost kind of style and they just pulse it back um, at around about a 10 kilohertz rate. They found that um, a group called Pulse Tech in America in the 90s were commissioned, is that the right word, by the American military to, um, to fix their battery problems. Because they, ha they have lead-acid batteries in who knows how much stuff worldwide. And imagine the cost of maintenance for them. So it was worth them to fund a couple of million dollars for this small company of three guys who were um, sort of like electrophysicists and also sort of electricians, they realized that if they could vibrate the plates literally, like on a mechanical kind of level through, through DC and AC pulses, at between 10 kilohertz and 15 kilohertz rates, the sulfate, like it, it's at about between 10 to 12 kilohertz that the sulfate crystal resonates. So it would become more ionically available in the liquid and then it would bond with the hydrogen and desulfate. And they're awesome. <laughs> If anyone doesn't have one and you have lead batteries, I highly recommend buying one. They're, they're amazing. Um, they need to be left permanently on the battery. They, they do desulfate, and then they, they continue to give out their pulses. But they need to be permanently left attached. They do suffer if you ever have um, uh, with inverters that are having some really weird sort of back EMF sine wave stuff going on with the batteries. They suffer from voltage spikes and frequency on the DC line. So. Sometimes they die and they are not cheap, but um, I, I thought an ultimate solution would be to combine, uh, if you had the money, you'd buy a pulse desulfator, combine it with an electrolyte change, you know, desulfate them back, and then take off your pulse converter, and you don't need to buy one for every battery, you've got it then, and it will no longer sulfate over that time. But um, there are a few avenues, you know, for this. Even the pulse tech guys who have invented the desulfating pulse technology, they kind of claim it on their website. I think it's pulsetech.org is their website. They claim an increase of up to five times the life cycle of the battery just, just using the, the pulse desulfator. It's like, wow, pretty crazy. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. The hydrogen gassing, the bubbling. Yeah. Yep. 
which is important because you need the hydrogen that's generated from the trickle charge to grab onto the sulfate that's been released from the plate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you do. I'll sell you a new battery. Yeah, totally. <laughs> that's great. So ironically, the batteries you probably got from the servos were almost brand new. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Ah, that's great. That's exciting. What kind of era? What kind of era were you doing that during? Yeah, yeah. And did you ever get into any of the pulse desulfating? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Um, people hear lots of, there's lots of different wise tales about different forms of battery desulfation, you know. There's a school of thought that's like higher voltage. There's a school of thought that says higher amperage. And so there's people with welders welding across terminals. And there's people like myself, you know, attaching 100, 200 volt solar banks to individual cells. And um, they all just do different things, you know. Like it's just about charge potential. But effectively, all of us, or everyone around the world who's trying to deal with this problem, is just trying to deal with this little guy here. So I thought, wow, why don't we just get rid of him? <laughs> just get rid of it. Just kick it out of the way. One of the issues is that, at least as far as my chemical and uh, my chemistry understanding goes, I have not found a replacement electrolyte yet. If anyone knows one, please let me know. Which would provide hydrogen to the same degree without any compound that's attached that would bond with the lead? No? No one put their hand up. Okay. <laughs> so, like, if let's say theoretically, and this is actually an invention, if you could come up with a liquid hydrogen um, in the battery, it would just run practically forever, yeah? The only thing that would be left would be, um, well, not even the kind of acid corrosion or positron. So as long as the voltage was stabilized, theoretically that would just be, in a perfect world, back and forward and back and forward. Who knows how many tens of, hundreds of thousands of life cycles, yeah? But in real world scenarios, and I don't have um, super coolers to make that happen, um, there are other acids, you know? Hydrogen. People get a lot of success with um, phosphoric acid orthophosphoric acid, H3PO4, which you can get from brewery shops. You know, they sell it as like a sanitizer. Um, you have to make sure you get like 99%. Sometimes it's mixed in with soaps and stuff, and that's just, you don't want, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Poor little battery. Um, but there are other people who've explored this, but to my knowledge, there's no one who's compiled it all together that I can find and sort of interested in coming up with something that could be a really actually valuable um, change in the chemistry, either to desulfate batteries from landfill or from waste stream so that people could build off-grid systems practically for free, or just to put them in brand new batteries, you know, get your brand new battery, buy it from RACV, dump out all your sulfate, your hydrogen sulfate, it's probably already sat on the shelf for six years anyway, but you know, hypothetically, um, fill it with a sulfate solution, you know, aluminium sulfate works the best, the highest voltage output, charge voltage, um, and, and just drive off. If anyone's interested, you can come and see the starter batteries of my diesel van are um, laundry powder, sodium sulfate, rocking. <laughs> I keep a voltmeter on the dash and I watch it. And the only times I've ever had problems, because I, I just drilled through it, so it was a valve regulated battery, yeah? So you just drill through the caps in the top, dump out the liquid, wash it a few times, try to get all of this sludge of the, um, the dioxide out. Refill it just with um, sodium sulfate, like laundry detergent powder, basically. And um, it's been great, I've been driving around for about a year. The only times that it's not worked is when I've, because I haven't plugged the lids, I haven't plugged the tops, I'll do lots of, I live in off-grid, uh, like, um, dirt roads, you know, and it sloshes liquid out of the cells, and I'll find that one of the cells is down and the plates are exposed. So I literally just found that if I just fill it back up, I can just get in and crank the engine and drive off. And I think, that's great! Like, those batteries were from 2007 as it was, and I don't see why they would stop working in any short amount of time, you know? Anyone, friends of mine or, or people come to the workshops, I, one guy just couldn't, like he kept writing on the Facebook page because um, he had this, uh, like, like an Audi or something. It came with the stock battery that it had since 2009 and he loved it and he'd taken all the care and he, you know, trickle charged every time that anything happened to it. You know, his son left the door open for five hours so he trickle charged the battery, you know, he's like, he was really onto it. And um, after this time, it was it was dying, and he had to he had to jump start the car to get it to the workshop. We were up at Yarra Junction doing a tiny house build, so we converted a 24 volt um, 600 amp hour set to sodium sulfate, and um, and we had all this sodium sulfate left over, 
and everyone else had left. And so it was just him, myself, and the tiny house owner, and a couple of other people. And I said, well, why don't you just, you know, everyone wants, like, go and get your car battery. We've already got tubs of, of um, there's tubs of lead floating in sulfuric acid we have to deal with anyway. What's an extra car battery to it, you know? So we did, he went and he got it, we drilled into it, and, you know, the, the liters of black sludge that came out, no wonder it was starting to, to drop down in voltage, um, was pretty impressive. But anyway, we washed it, he held out no hope. He was, he was quite a skeptic on it. We filled it back up, it cranked over straight away, because, because you've got to think like, what causes a lot of, what causes the uh, ability for the discharge reaction is both for the lead dioxide to be on the positive plate, and therefore to be hydrogen in the liquid somewhere available to, to, to form water and allow this electron transfer process. So it must have just worked out to his to our favor that because he'd driven it six hours before, there was still um, sulfuric acid on the on the negative plate embedded in it, like kind of intercalated to the lead, enough that it, hydrogen could cause it to start. You know, I didn't think it was going to start without a charge. Anyway, he started, he drove off. And then he wrote me a message that night saying, hey, I can't believe it. Like, I turned the car off, I turned it back on, I went to the shops, I turned it off a week later, it's still going, you never had to trickle charge it. <laughs> and so he just went on, you know, he jumped up like another 10 people for the next workshop, which was great. I haven't heard from him since, so I assume it's still working fine. That was September last year. That's right, that's right. But yeah, I, I haven't heard from him, so that's good news. But, um, but yeah, that's right, no news is good news. Yes? Um, Yeah, uh, yeah. How, how do you neutralize them? Awesome question. So, um, because we've been doing this on a larger scale, like workshops, and, and um, just to paint you guys a picture, I'm aware I'm over my 15 minutes now, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, we could all be dead. Um, so, um, because we were doing a very large, we're doing large off grid changes, so just to paint a picture, the 24 volt, 600 amp um, set that we did for this workshop. Uh, sort of the batteries would be about half the total, like half the length of this table and about as high um, in tubs, tubular wound, and, um, and it was about 82 litres of um, electrolyte poured out that we had to replace. So we had these massive tubs. So what we did was we took all, like we had a one, I got big blue... Um, you know those kind of chemical uh, barrels you can get with the lockable lids, the big 120 litre ones, IPC barrel, um, with lots of goggles, <laughs> lots of gloves, lots of masks, you know, if possible a full gas, like, you know, respirator, but we're doing big scale. Um, keep dumping all of the, the used sulfuric acid out and all the lead particles come out with it. Because lead is insoluble in, in uh, the acid, or to the point of like, I think its solubility is 0 0.00012 grams per liter. So it's relatively negligible. Over time, after like an hour or two, all the lead settles to the bottom of the tub and you get just this crystal clear kind of, um, it's no longer five mole because most of that's gone, most of that sulfate gone onto the plate. But um, it tested to be about two and a half to three mole acid. So then what we did was we got another tub and we ended up getting lots of cotton sheets I was thinking, how can we filter this in a way that's like, you can't just use a little coffee filter. We've got like 80 liters, you know, it's like, wow. So, so we ended up getting about three layers of old cotton sheets that he just had lying around. You know? And we basically just fit them into the tub as a massive filter, put on the lock ring, cut a hole in the lid, put the lock ring on so it wasn't going anywhere, poured all this through, and it was perfect. We caught all the lead as an actual paste, you know, in the cotton sheets. Um, I haven't neutralized it yet. And then in the, the tub was just the, the sulfuric. We did that twice, so we double filtered it. And the last one, we couldn't, there was no trace of the lead particle that we could see. And then we were able to sort of tie up the lead. That went into a bucket that went straight to the heavy metal recycling place. So they take lead acid batteries. Turns out they take lead in a bucket as well, <laughs> which is great. And they weigh it. <laughs> yeah, it's even better, you get more money back. It's a lot of process. Um, that was good. Um, yeah, that's what it was like running. The guy just looked at me. <laughs> just don't ask, don't ask. Um, but, so then now that we had this tub of um, 2.5 to 3 moles sulfuric, I simply took a titration. Like I, I made up, um, I just had bicarb on me. So I just, I just took one mil of the 
the total electrolyte volume in this sulfuric tub and titrated one mil of um, 0 0.1 mole bicarb, worked out my titration amount. You could look up titration online to Google to work out, to, to understand how that works, but it gives you a total amount of uh, neutralizing reagent that you would need. So you know exactly how much bicarb, for example, you need. So if, say, you worked out, okay, with the concentration and the volume of acid we have, I need to go to Woolworths and I need to buy 15 kilos of bicarb. <laughs> this is a lot of battery acid, by the way. You could do it with um, caustic soda and it would be like, you know, you could do it with like a litre of, you know, it would be quite impressive, but something that's cheap and readily available, you could neutralize it with bicarb. And effectively, what you just form then is sodium sulfate, which is ironic because that's exactly the thing that we were putting in the battery to start with, um, but to a relatively unknown concentration. So you neutralize it. The hydrogen forms water. The sodium comes out of the bicarb to bond with the sulfate, and it forms sodium sulfate plus carbon dioxide plus water is the total neutralization reaction. Um, after we pH tested that to a pH of about 7, then it was poured into um, the toilet drains, like the toilet system that was attached to the Melbourne water, um, you know, the sewage system. So that was how we dealt with that particular one. Um, in terms of if you had like a fully off-grid property and you didn't have access to mains water or sewage, you you could theoretically neutralize this and just pour it on the ground, but you'd want to really make sure that you'd filtered five, six times, you know, to, to really clear out any lead particles that would be that would be left through paper filters and things like that. Yeah, I got another question. Uh, how do you uh, clean out the gel um, battery? Pardon? Oh, how the gel battery? Yeah, yeah. I have not been able to. So, so this is all working on... Um, on wet lead acid, so either it's called flooded lead, which is like capped with the with the screw caps, or valve regulated lead acid, um, which is basically lead acid that either has calcium or um, antimony or silver in the in an alloy to reduce the oxygen and hydrogen gassing, and then they it's not really sealed. That's a lie. It's just it's just that there's no caps, but there are small vents, rubber vent holes in the battery. So those batteries are all wet liquid filled and that's what I'm basing this on. Um, the AGM, the absorbed glass mat, can be rejuvenated because all it is is a fiberglass separator which holds the sulfuric acid. So I have found that if you literally tip the battery upside down and leave it overnight, you just the sheer gravity will, will sort of displace the, um, not displace is the wrong word, it will draw out the remaining uh, liquid from the AGM sheet and then you can just top it up or fill it with your sulfate solution. The gel batteries, I have not even started on. I, I don't, I know that the, the, some of the gels they use are like um, um, petroleum polymers, but I don't really, I don't understand how to change that chemistry yet. So if you try it out, let me know. <laughs> so, <laughs> what would happen to the battery? <clears throat> yep. So um, what we ended up doing for one of the um, uh, one of the case studies, because what I wanted to do was start gathering data for this. So ended up doing case studies for lots of off-grid um, rejuvenations, and and they send me voltage data and amp hour discharge rates every month and C rates, because um, I wanted to build longer-term data than just my own experiments. So with one of them, we decided, well, let's have a look at what happens if we were to desulfate it. So it, it had um, aluminium sulfate, a combination of aluminium and magnesium sulfate, which there was a purpose for that, but it didn't work out. So <laughs> whatever. Um, that was just run on a kind of dis deep discharge and charge from solar for six months. And then it, that was all, there was a second workshop. We poured all that out, and we wanted to replace it with sulfuric acid again. So what we did was when we in, had the initial rejuvenation workshop and we tipped out the first batch of the, um, the battery acid, again, we filtered out, we filtered out all the lead particles. We kept this, you know, and that one was like a smaller battery, it was about 60, 55 litres of um, electrolyte. So we had this tub on his property of, you know, big death face on them, like definitely don't open this. Um, and once we came back for the second workshop, we simply... 
we simply dropped the, uh, we kind of let the lid off that to evaporate down to a concentration that we wanted. And that allowed us to fill up all but one of the cells. And then we went to um, Battery World to get some sulfuric at five mole to fill the last cell. So we were able to just reuse that. If you had a source of greater concentration sulfuric, you could definitely just mix out your concentrations in water and get back. But the average, the, the standard average is about five mole. They vary between 4.5 and six. Because ironically, since the hydrogen is the, the the grams of hydrogen that are available in the liquid is directly proportional to the amount of oxygen that it can displace off the positive. So if you have a very weak acid and you say you've got, let's say you've got one gram of hydrogen per litre available to strip, and I'd have this, that I can calculate, but the grams of oxygen I can't even calculate. This is hypothetically, say, 50 grams of um, of oxygen on the plate, you know, that's made up. No one quote me on that gram of oxygen. Um, I haven't weighed the oxygen on the plate. You can see how there's just not enough hydrogen in the liquid available to do anything more than strip one gram of, um, or not even that, half, <laughs> 0 0.5 gram, you know, into H2O. So if you can increase the concentration of the acid, technically you start to increase the amp hour rating. Um, some cool experiments, if you want to do, if you're having fun, are to dump out your battery acid of your 100 amp battery, your deep cycle, refill it with 18 mole sulfuric acid, and uh, draw 350 amp hours out of your 100 amp battery. But it'll be dead in about a week. Like, the rate of sulfation is so, especially at that, like an 18 mole, would be so excessive um, that it just would just disintegrate, you know? And then conversely, you could, you could have a lower concentration of sulfuric acid and you'd extend the, life cycle, the lifespan of your battery, but you'd have compromised. Instead of 100 amps, it might only give you 50 amps, something like that. So there's a whole, it's going to be like there's so many little areas to this that um, I, for one, would love to see a lot more centralized databasing and information about. Um, I, I think it would be awesome to be able to go to a battery shop and on the shelf, you buy your batteries by your uh, metal sulfate that you're interested in in the properties. You, know? so you can be like, oh, I'll have a magnesium sulfate battery today and uh, aluminium sulfate. They have different properties, like um, that chart that I showed before with the solubility and molarity data, where we were looking at 61 grams of potassium, 131 grams of, um, of sodium, etc., 300 grams of aluminium. They all do different things. And I don't have a slide for this, but just to give you a bit of a... Um, a picture, I'm sure you'll all be able to see this, if I can find it again. Um, the different sulfates, the different metals have different characteristics and they allow different things to occur. So sodium sulfate, I have found, is the fastest to charge. Like it takes charge immensely quickly. Um, I can go from a completely flat starter battery, and I have two um, in parallel, I can go from a flat starter battery that won't crank my 2.5 litre diesel engine at all, and I can give it one jump start, immediately turn the engine off, and crank it ongoingly, again and again and again, from the same charge. Really weird, it's fascinating, you know? And I think, so there's something going on with the sodium in how it's attracted through electrostatic forces that is different from the actual plate reaction. And I'm still exploring that. But that's, that's basically how lithium works. The lithium, ironic, hopefully, doesn't necessarily form a compound with either electrode, but it just gets moved and held in polarity near, one, near the anode and then discharges back in. So it'd be interesting if you, if you could find out that a similar process was actually occurring. And um, maybe it's going to take me too long to find this drawing I was trying to show you, but um, magnesium sulfate sort of tends to give me like approximately 70 to 80% of the amp hour capacity of the original battery. Um, and it's an average charge, you know, kind of similar to sulfuric acid. Aluminium sulfate can give me almost three times the discharge, the instantaneous discharge amps, which is fascinating. So cold cranking amps, you know, hey, there's an answer to that. Don't have to increase the acid concentration. For what, in whatever way, I don't understand how it is that the aluminium interacts in that process to allow that to occur. Maybe just through greater, like, a less, less resistance to the battery and therefore a greater amount of amp 
um, travel of the same voltage potential, I don't know. But aluminium sulfate acts completely differently to um, ammonium sulfate, which acts completely different to magnesium sulfate. So this is, I feel like I've barely scratched the surface, you know. I've been researching it for about 10 years, um, experimenting for about four years with myself and started doing the workshops about two years ago. The longest data that we have for both my battery conversions and the case studies are about one and a half years at this rate. And it's like I've we barely started. And like I said, this is, this is just on sulfates. Imagine if you did this on phosphates and nitrates and all, and, and sulfides. There's so many potentials. And I, I think, um, not that I'm sure, I'm sure the lead-acid battery doesn't particularly care whether we leave it behind or not, but just given that currently we have a worldwide infrastructure that is producing and distributing lead-acid batteries, and you th of the amount of lead that must be already being recycled and returned to that system, you know, I saw an average that said that Exide now only mine 30, they only have 30% input of new lead and new plastic products into the same total output per year of gross domestic, domestic product. So that means that 70% of their resources every year are coming through recycling of the lead and the plastic and the sulfuric acid that's already, that's already in circulation. Yeah. So I just think it is entirely feasible that there could be a, a, a change, even just a slight change. We're not talking about a massive change to the, we're just talking about like a liquid change, really. A slight change to the chemistry could potentially mean that you could buy batteries off the shelf that last for decades. And I wonder if that would provide, certainly an interim for off-grid storage that is, I'll add just a sec, between like, you know, 10, 20, 30 years of lifespan at this point where we are between old school lead acid and moving away from a centralized grid system and into um, like power line and the NMC, NCA off-grid lithium um, cells. Yes. I always thought part of the battery recycling was that they recycled the acid as well. And they do. So have you thought of taking your acid somewhere instead yeah. of just pouring it into the sewer? I have, you mean like, like, like I said, we do um, attempt to well, we neutralize it as far as we can go, testing on pH, attempt to sort of remove lead out of it. But um, I would much more prefer to be able to take the, um, the whole tub, you know, lead included, to a Haschem um, company in place where they have all the infrastructure in place to, to do that. I think that would be a much smarter idea. What I have found, I only approached one place, I can't remember their name, in Camberwell, um, that were working with... Chemwatch or Haschem, I can't remember the name. Um, they basically were disinterested in working with myself and my team for that workshop because we weren't a business that was, we weren't a, a, like a, a battery recycling business. We weren't something they were going to form a contract with. And, and it was a shame because I think that would have been a much smarter idea. So that's why we ended up coming up with a solution. Bless you. A solution at that time. It's certainly not the best solution. <laughs> And um, I think that if there was a, um, if something like this was to, to be more available for, for homebrew kind of setup and for the, for the, you know, builders, engineers in the garage kind of mentality. They don't take sulfuric acid, I found out. So unless you just lie and you put it in a paint tin. <laughs> one, of, one of the tricks that, um, well, one of, one of the guys who came to one of the workshops, he said that what he's been doing is just getting, so he'll get lots of batteries anywhere he sees them on the side of the road, pick them up, and they're pretty much dry, you know, they've been sitting there. He just uses them to pour the, the lead sludge into and then takes them to the battery recyclers. Because um, he, he says the same thing, he figures they, re, they recycle it all anyway. So what's, and I, I don't know why they didn't want to work with us in terms of just taking buckets of, of, um, sulfuric acid at varying concentration. But if anyone knows of a place that would work on a residential level or domestic level, please let me know because it would be really helpful. That's right. And like, I mean, I understand there's probably a whole world of issues, you know, like, because they're having to rely on labor. You'd think they'd test. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I was just wondering whether the, the battery manufacturers thought about offering uh, reconstituted batteries because I mean they'd obviously have the ability to handle these um, fairly uh, yep. dangerous chemicals on a much greater scale and it seemed to me that they could 
So yep. we can buy a brand new battery or we can buy a rejuvenated battery at maybe half the cost. Yeah. It's a great question. <laughs> right, right, I, okay. I don't know. I mean, to my knowledge, what's that? There are um, the, the Renew um, and Reborn, Born Again, I think is a name of a, which is ironic. <laughs> it's, a, it's a name of a company that um, rejuvenate batteries. And I, are they in Campbellford? Oh, no, that's um, Battery Stop, isn't it? I know that guy. Oh, do they do the, re, the Born Again, Reborn ones? Because ah, I've seen that he sells the clear acrylic Telstra batteries, the old 70s batteries from Telecom. Um, and they're very clean, you know. And I've seen that he's using the Pulse D sulfate as, right. Um, so there are little companies around that are doing that. I was more interested, sort of not so much in just entering a, a marketplace. That's why I never, I thought, I'm not going to patent this. I have no interest in making money out of this. I'm far more interested in a world where it doesn't have lead acid batteries in rivers in India. So, so under a Creative Commons license and then workshopping to try to just see, has anyone else worked on this? Is there a collaboration of information? Is there anyone who's interested or in a position, you know, who, who either has worked with batteries in the past, has communication, that kind of thing, just to start a process of seeing whether or not it would be possible to utilize the current enormous lead acid infrastructure and create something that could last for decades and be an interim, even if at, at the least, be an interim off-grid storage battery between where we currently are and the shift towards better battery technology. It's no lie, like any, everyone would have to agree that there are obviously better battery technologies just over the horizon, you know, and I think we've just seen the beginning of it. So in the next 20 to 30 years, the, it would be unfathomable what the um, sort of energy density, what hour to kilo ratios would be, the nano tubular style batteries, like all that stuff is definitely going to shift our entire way we think of batteries and even have a use for batteries at all in the kind of way that we think of them now. But that's not here today. And I think that there are, a, there's just a, there's too many environmental concerns at the moment in terms of the infrastructure we have and the mismanagement of our resources. Lithium ion, as great as they are, doesn't, doesn't um, win out over that in any way. You know, like the mass open cut mining for lithium is, is just as tragic as coal production. You know, like it's, it's, um, it's in many ways just shifted a lot of the focus to a different industry. But we're still, there's still river pollution through cyanide runoff for, um, for synthesizing lithium, you know, out of like the bismuth and the lead and the ore and all that kind of stuff. So instead of kind of leaving a chemistry that could work really well behind, and just say it's totally over and we're moving on to something that's that's the future you know it's better i think that there would be there's a place where this could be utilized and if not by mass mainstream if if the commercial products want to move in a certain direction that's fine but um i have certainly started working with permaculture groups and off-grid houses to start building very large off-grid lead-based battery systems for free and that seems to be a catch it's amazing when you write a workshop and you say um you know 50 kilowatt hour lead acid battery system for free. You get 100 people. It's fascinating. <laughs> it's amazing. And then you just talk about the process and then they think that you're in crazy. One guy asked me if it was my PhD that I did, which was brilliant. I got to, I just said no, I didn't actually, you know, sort of go into maybe it should be someone's, like maybe someone out there wants to do that. Um, so that's, that's basically, I'll sort of leave it at that in terms of presenting information. Any other questions, I'm happy to, um, to answer or chit chat and, um, and we can, Pick my brain further later. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I rode my bike here from Coburg and I didn't get a bit toned. Woo! Nice. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All good. Sweet. <laughs> Oh, for, I think he'd be right up for that. I, I, uh, I can't imagine why, why he'd want to take like that. Malcolm Turnbull, Turnbull and our Innovation Nation. That's right. That's very true. It's a part of innovation here, isn't it? Mm. On those. So I've let Dominic talk tonight because it's been very interesting. <laughs> I mean, yes, it has been very interesting for everyone to hear about some of the work that he's doing, mm. some of the achievements that he's done already on those and what he's working on and, uh, you know, where it could all be going. Thank it's you. It's been very interesting. Thank you, Dominic. Thank very you very much.
Thank you very much. And uh, Dominic will be staying. Dominic will stay for some questions later. Yes. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a cup of tea and things and that. So we've gone for a while tonight. So I'm not going to bother doing my presentation. <laughs> I'll do it another night. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> on those, unless you all want to. On those. But um, you know, we've talked quite a bit on this on, um, tonight. On those, and I can use that for another night. On those, so that would be fine. That's what I'd rather do. Oh. Yeah. Well, apologies. Uh, that wasn't. No, 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 thank, no, thank you very much no, for um so for the conversation. Go, go ahead with that. Thank you, Paul. But, um, we pretty well covered it all tonight. So, um, if you want to go to the tea room? We can um, then chat. And if people want to ask any more informal questions on those, um, they're welcome ahead to do that. Mm. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Apologies.